On this exciting episode of the Perry Pod, we find out how Perry takes his potatoes, make them lionese, or don't bother making them at all. It's season one, episode 13 of Perry Mason, The Case of the Moth Eaten Mink. Welcome to the 13th episode of The Perry Pod. I'm your humble host, Jonathan Searcy, and my purpose here is pretty simple. Provide an audio companion to the greatest legal drama in television history, Perry Mason. I plan to do a pod for every episode of the television series and, if time permits, to cover some of those made-for-TV movies, too. I'll be working through the series in the order in which the episodes were aired. Each week, I'll give a brief refresher on the plot, and if the episode was based on a novel, I'll compare the book with its television adaptation. Next, I'll list some key pieces of trivia as well as tackle the episode's main theme. We'll feature a Perry proverb, a moment of wisdom from the man himself, and then we'll finish with a post-case water cooler, where just like Perry, Della, and Paul, we can rehash the ins and outs of their adventures. But first, to the law library! <laughs> Each week in the Law Library, we return to prior episodes to refresh our memories about Perry's past so we can find fresh precedents for future cases. This week, we revisit the dog who chased Sally Fenner in the case of the negligent nymph. My dad adroitly noticed that this was not a police dog, as I claimed in the episode on the negligent nymph, but rather a private Doberman watchdog. Right you are, Daddy-O. In that previous episode, I discussed how crucial the dog was to the novel, something the teleplay writer Richard Gray decided to ditch. It then made me wonder what other episodes thus far in the Perry world have involved animals, since Raymond Burr was famously described this way in a 1958 issue of TV Star Parade. Quote, He has tried to insulate himself against loneliness with an orchard, greenhouse and vegetable garden, and a slew of pets, including dogs and ducks, chickens, rabbits, and turtles. Wow. In these early episodes, however, we don't get that kind of teeming animal life roaming the blacktop jungle of Los Angeles. Before the Doberman guard dog, the last significant animal we saw was the drowning duck way out in Logan City. We'll meet a horse in a few episodes too, but Noah's Ark or even Raymond's Animal Refuge, this is not. Now to this week's episode. The Case of the Moth-Eaten Mink. This episode was the pilot for The Perry Mason Show and was filmed a year earlier than its other season one compatriots. The episode traffics in urban noir and accordingly opens at nighttime on a Los Angeles city street. Neon lights usher us into a big restaurant, Maury's, that finds its sizzle in more than its steak. Perry and Della walk in and quickly get a seat, they know Maury, where they're revealed to not only be frequent customers, but pretty routine in their menu choices. Maury, we'll have two. I know, I know. Two big steaks, lionade potatoes, two salads, coffee. That's a mind reader. Perry brings more than an empty stomach with him when he enters a public place, though. He brings his penchant for being at the center of criminal proceedings. The brouhaha he encounters this time involves a young waitress named Dixie Dayton. When a restaurant patron, one of those rotund types who plies his trade in cement and contracting or linen supply, takes a seat and catches Dixie's eyes, she forgets Mason's stakes, bolts out the back door, and finds herself on the wrong end of an alley-dwelling ne'er-do-wells gunfire. (laughs) 
When the bullets don't take, the gunman decides to run her over. Dixie escapes, only to be run over by one of Maury's own employees. You might know the actor better as Rod Gleason, the defendant from episode 3, The Case of the Sulky Girl. It's a cinch the rotund man will be our murder victim and Dixie will be Perry's client. Maury asks for Perry's help and slips Perry and Della the titular moth-eaten mink, which he claims belongs to Dixie. If you're going to give me that mink coat because we had to wait so long, I'll take it. Mr. Mason, this, this coat belongs to Dixie Dayton, the waitress. That coat? Well, it's not as good as it looks. There are a few moth holes. But it's mink. A waitress with a mink coat. Despite its moth-eaten appearance, the coat implies a rich backstory and literally hides a pawn ticket that Perry decides to investigate using his trusty detective, Paul. Only the pawnbroker told the cops that the same party had pawned two items. What were they? The ticket the cops had was for a diamond engagement ring. The number you gave me covered something a little more interesting. A gun. Smith & Wesson 38, a police special. Cops gun? It's a little heavy for a handbag. A policeman's gun that was used to kill an L.A. vice cop named Claremont. I have a feeling that, that Maury's in this thing up to his ears. Worse than that, he may be in over his head. The fact is, you might want to give him back his retainer. Why? Perry, do you remember the Claremont case? It was in the newspapers about a year ago. Claremont? It was a cop. That's right, a young detective. Here's a picture of him. We got it from the newspaper files. He was taken for a ride, real mob style, shot with his own gun and thrown out on the highway. I recall. Before he was killed, Claremont was seen talking with a bookie named Tom Sedgwick. After the killing, the Sedgwick disappeared. He's wanted right now. It's a picture of him. They never found Claremont's killer, did they? They never even found the gun. That is, not until today. Dixie Dayton's pawn ticket was a pledge for that gun. Uh-oh, somebody's going to need a lawyer. Meanwhile, Dixie pieces out from the hospital she's convalescing in, presumably because the rotund man who sent her scurrying in the first place is one George Fayette, a small-time hoodlum who was himself connected to the case that ended with Claremont's death. To make matters worse, Perry can't track Maury down. Eesh! Just when Perry's trying to get some sleep, he gets a phone call from Maury that he and Dixie are holed up in a straight out of L.A. casting dive hotel called the Keymont. Hello? Go ahead, Mr. Mason. Hello? Mr. Mason. Maury, what kind of a runaround? I gotta see you, Mr. Mason. I've been trying to reach you all day. Now, tomorrow morning, I want you... Morning could be too late. I must see you tonight. Misery and lack of sleep both love company, so Perry gets Paul to schlep with him down to the dingy hotel. They don't find Dixie or Maury, but thanks to a mysterious lipstick message on the bottom of one of the hotel's chintzy tables, they do find George Fayette's body and the coppers. Lieutenant Tragg is joined this time by Sergeant Jaffrey from Vice, Claremont's commanding officer. This is Sergeant Jaffrey, Vice Squad. Vice Squad? One of his officers was killed a while back. This thing may be tied in with it. Claremont case? What do you know about Claremont? Only what I've been told. Who told you? That's confidential. Cut the stalling, Mason. What are you doing in this room? I don't think that's important. We decide what's important. Things don't look good for Dixie or Maury, especially when it turns out that Maury's stepbrother and Dixie's fiancé, Tom Sedgwick, is the key suspect in the Claremont case. For the pilot episode of a courtroom drama, the case of the moth-eaten mink offers a lot of sizzle with very little steak. We only get one courtroom witness, Frank Hoxie, clerk from the Kemont. State your name, address, and occupation. Frank Hoxie, Kimmont Hotel, night clerk. Mr. Hoxie, are you acquainted with the defendants in this case? Yes, sir, I am. When and where did you meet them? At the Kimmont Hotel on the 2nd of this month. And the climactic confrontation that ends with the murderer being arrested doesn't even happen in court. It happens in Perry's office. Why don't you make it easy on yourself? How? Give up? What are you talking about? 
You killed Claremont and you killed Fayette. Or you had him killed. Mason, are you out of your mind? The murderer is, wait for it, the vice cop, Jeffrey. Maury gets his restaurant back and Paul Drake, for all of his hard work, gets some much-deserved chocolate ice cream. I'll buy lemon dessert. Ice cream for me, Maury. Chocolate. Teleplay writers Lawrence Marks and Ben Starr rewrote some crucial parts of the 1952 novel that spawned the episode. Number one, in the novel, there's a runaround with a fake Dixie Dayton, a plot complication that's meant to show us the lengths to which the criminal network in the case will go to distract our intrepid hero. Number two, in the novel, Berger actually puts Perry on the stand as a witness. The only novel I can recall where that's happened which is not to say there's not another one. I just don't remember another one where I've seen that happen. And it's something we don't see in the show until the case of the Sunbather's Diary. And finally, number three, the book ends with Trag confessing to Perry that he shot and killed Sergeant Jaffrey. Good cop on bad cop justice. In the show, Trag shoots Jaffrey in the arm and then bemoans the bad name cops get from corrupt so-and-sos like Jaffrey. I don't know if a vigilante cop execution, which is what Gardner implies in his book, is going to improve the LAPD's rep, but what do I know? Now, let's get trivial, shall we? Each week in our trivia section, I give you three takeaways. A Paul, which is a subject worth investigating more. A Della, which is something about a particular character in the story. And a Perry, which is something we learn about our main character. This week's Paul concerns Raymond Burr's tight and frankly just straight out bad haircut. Just before he'd gotten the gig for Perry, Burr had been in a film noir called Affair in Havana alongside John Cassavetes. Burr's role required him to have cropped hair that was dyed white. And intriguingly, Burr spends most of the film in a wheelchair. The basic plot of the film is that Cassavetes falls for Burr's wife. So this week's research prompt is track down the film Affair in Havana and see what glimpses of Burr's two TV triumphs Perry Mason, and then Ironside, you can pick up. Ardella this week concerns May Nolan, the Maury's waitress that Mason snookers into spilling the goods on Dixie, Maury, and the gang. You mean Maury gave Dixie a mink coat? Yeah, the one you took out of the restaurant last night. Nolan was portrayed by actress Roxanne Arlen, who was apparently offered this role as a consolation prize for not getting picked for the part she did a screen test for, Della Street. Needless to say, Perry Mason would have been a very different series had Arlen gotten the gig. I think Gail Patrick and the production team got this one right. Our focus on May Nolan is a good segue into this week's Perry, where we learn all sorts of things about our intrepid hero's restaurant habits. One, he likes to order the same thing every time. Make those potatoes lionese. Two, he's a big tipper. By the way, the next time you eat at Maury's place, I hope you'll ask for my table. <laughs> I think she's got you spotted for a big tipper, Perry. And three, if you develop a good business relationship with him, he's more likely to take you on as a client when you get charged with a murder. This week's theme is tarnished goods. It's right there in the title. The mink that Maury holds for Dixie is Cherse, but because of neglect, it looks tarnished. Its quality gets obscured by real but ultimately superficial problems. In short, it's a metaphor for every single Perry client. Dixie, Maury, they're all moth-eaten minks that Perry must restore to their full luster. That quest begins here, in the case of the moth-eaten mink. But the theme extends beyond the mink coat. Consider the crooked Kemont Hotel. With a cop-killing vice squad sergeant as its owner, it's no wonder it's a debt of iniquity. This is an example of tarnished goods reflecting tarnished owners. Finally, let's consider the police badge and law enforcement name that Sergeant Jaffrey tarnishes. You all right, Jack? 
Yeah. Just sick to my stomach at the sight of him. You work hard at your job, you try to take some pride in what you're doing, and then a, a fink like this comes along and makes a rotten thing out of his badge. The crime in this pilot episode testifies to corruption in the very institutions Perry is fighting against. During the remainder of the show, Mason proves that the DA and the cops can't do their job very well. But that's a far cry from saying that the DA and the cops are actively preying upon the innocent. Berger's just dumb. Trag isn't dumb or crooked. He's just trapped in a state bureaucracy under a dopey boss. Here, alone in the pilot, is a much darker version of the series where instead of hapless opponents, Perry finds evil antagonists. Justice is tarnished throughout Perry's show, but it's not as irredeemably soiled as the Kemont Hotel. And thank goodness for that. Now to our Perry proverb. When Maury asks Perry what he wants for dessert, he responds this way. Right, how about you, Mr. Mason? Oh, anything and coffee. Anything? Anything but a moth-eaten mink. <laughs> this isn't that funny, but it shows us something about Perry's disposition. I think he's telling Maury, hey, just let me eat. If I wanted to pick up murder cases after office hours, I'd be hanging with Lieutenant Trag. Can a guy just get some lionese potatoes in peace? Please. Coming in loud and clear, Perry. Now it's time to grab a swig from the water cooler. one thing I don't understand. Go on, Paul. Thanks so much to those of you who gave me feedback on the last episode, The Case of the Negligent Imp. My Aunt Myra writes in to say that she liked Paul's line, I'm no tourist, as he bravely and unwisely downs Anita Santos's salsa. And my father let me know that the TV episode and novel comparisons were better organized this time around, which is always good to hear. As always, I'd love feedback about this particular episode or the podcast in general. Was there something about this week's pod that you'd like to comment on? Something that you'd like to correct? You can leave comments on the pod's website at theperrypod.libsyn.com or email me at theperrypod at gmail.com. You'll find those links in the show notes. Thanks again for joining me on this pod journey. Join me next time when we find out what the family-less Perry thinks of orphanages. It's the case of the baited hook. Until then, this is Jonathan Searcy saying, Keep on walking that Fifth Avenue beat!